All right, sounds good. Well, welcome everybody. Thank you so much for attending this month's uh, Nuance Tech Talk series. Um, I'm Tirza Abbott. I manage the Epic SEM facility and also here is my team, Elizabeth King and Nathaniel Cabot. And today I'm going to introduce you to some of the in-situ heating and cooling capabilities that we have on one of our SEMs in the lab, specifically um, the Quanta 650 FEG SEM. So this SEM is what we like to call our Swiss Army Knife SEM because of the number of unique capabilities that it offers. It is a Shockey field emission gun, so it's very uh, useful for high resolution imaging and it has a high stable probe current, which is great for microanalysis. So just to go over the instrument a little bit, it does have your standard Everhart Thornley secondary electron detector, um, a dedicated backscattered electron detector, and it has two special detectors for low vacuum and environmental or ESAM mode operations. Additionally, it has um, electron beam lithography and also an uh, EDS detector and an electron backscatter diffraction detector. Both of these systems are going to be updated soon, um, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about that later, but we're very excited about that. But today, we're gonna focus on heating and cooling. So if you're familiar with this instrument, um, or if you've used it before, you may not know that this instrument actually has had a cooling stage for as long as I've been here. Um, so hopefully this will inspire you to think of some fun experiments that you might be able to use this stage for. And then coming soon, we will be adding high temperature heating capabilities. So, so what I'm going to go over today. So it's hard to talk about the cooling stage um, without first talking about low vacuum and environmental SEM modes. And just to be clear, we're not gonna talk about cryo SEM today or cryo SEM preparation. That's like a totally different topic. We're gonna talk about just going down to maybe minus 25 degrees C. Um, then I'm going to introduce the Thermo Fisher cooling stage that we currently have and introduce you to the Gatan Murano heating stage, which we um, are currently in the process of finishing up the installation for. I'm gonna go over the basic working principles of each of these things during the course of this talk, and then we're gonna open it up for discussion at the end. So in traditional SEM um, in high vacuum mode, um, we, when the beam, when the electron beam interacts with your sample, um, the electrons will, or secondary electrons will be emitted from the sample and collected by the lower Everhart Thornley detector. So it rasters across your sample, it collects the secondary electron signal as it's rastering, and then the detector generates your image. But when you have a sample that's non-conductive and you haven't coated it with a conductive layer, um, those, uh, your sample, or you will, might see in the image some, a few different artifacts, charging artifacts. So this is what your image should look like or normally looks like. This image is a zinc oxide particle that's been coated with gold palladium. But if your sample is not conductive, what happens is you get a buildup of negative charge on the surface with no path to ground. And so because of this, you may see horizontal streaking in the image, uneven brightness, um, or even image distortions and drifting. A lot of people think that their sample is moving, but really it's just the charge deflecting the beam. And so this is a, an example of a microorganism that's created or, or creates a, a, an SiO2 shell. This is not coded, so you can see the horizontal streaking uh, charging artifacts. So how low vacuum mode works is it introduces a small amount of gas into the chamber and the gas in the chamber will obstruct the mean free path of the primary electron beam creating this uh, beam skirt. Um, and so to help kind of combat this, we work at closer working distances and higher accelerating voltages. But in this interaction, you'll still create negative charge on the surface of the sample and emit secondary electrons from that interaction. And the secondary electrons that are emitted from the sample will interact with and ionize the gas inside the chamber and create a cascade or avalanche of, of electrons that will be detected by a special detector and a positively charged gas ion that can um, or will be attracted to the negative charge buildup on the surface of the sample and neutralize that charge. Um, so the detector that is using here is a special low vac detector. Um, you can also use with this particular detector, the backscattered electron detector that gets inserted at the base of the pull piece. So this detector right here is called the large field detector, and it is also similar to the Everhart Thornley detector. It is able to collect some backscattered electron signals, so primary beam electrons that um, just shoot back up out of the sample and are often are always higher energy than secondary electrons. 
And so when we take our image or the sample that we had before, the uh, SiO2 shells, using low vacuum mode, you can see the image quality has improved. Now introducing gas into the chamber and this beam skirting will reduce the imaging resolution a little bit, but as you can see, we don't see any more charging artifacts. So this is low vacuum mode. Low vacuum or uh, variable pressure mode is also available on two of our other SEMs. The other SEMs use uh, air as the low vacuum gas. One of them uses nitrogen and the Quanta uses water vapor. It can also use air. It has an auxiliary port for other gases. And low vacuum mode typically or uh, always is operated at um, about one and a half to two torr, depending on the microscope that you're on. So again, this is for imaging pristine non-conductive samples. Sometimes you can't code a sample because you have to do other types of analysis on it after the SEM. And so using this mode is really great. You can see in this lo the low end of a water phase diagram, the low vacuum mode again can only go up to on some SEMs to um, TOR or around 200 Pascals. Um, so you can see that on this phase diagram that in low vacuum mode, you'll never get your sample in the liquid phase. So with low vac mode, it's uh, a lot of people think that you can put wet samples in the SEM, and this is not necessarily true because um, the sample at room temperature, you would have to go to really high pressures in order to maintain that liquid phase. And so for um, higher pressure uh, analysis, we can actually use what's called environmental SEM mode on this microscope. And environmental SEM mode allows us to go up to 30 torr or 4,000 pascals. Again, um, this is also for imaging pristine samples, but we can't use either of these modes without specialized detectors. So we can't use the Everhart Thornley or secondary electron detector because um, how it basically works is it has a scintillator that has a really high positive bias uh, in it. So it's about 10 kV. And so the um, high bias of the detector can easily ionize the gas and arc the detector ground. So we can't use the Everhart Thornley detector at all to detect the secondary electrons. So we use a normal kind of low vac mode to two tor um, this large field detector. It gives you a large field of view. Um, and it's always inserted right behind the pull piece in the quanta. And uh, it has a very important device inserted at the base of the pull piece called the pressure limiting aperture. So this pressure limiting aperture helps prevent any of the high pressure in the chamber from going back up into the column. So this is always inserted on the base of the pull piece. So you can switch to low vac mode during a normal SEM session. So if you put your sample in in high vac, you notice that it's charging, you can switch to low vac mode without having to add any accessories or do anything really special to protect the SEM. In addition to this, you can add other accessories. So um, like we talked about, when the beam interacts with the gas, it, the gas obstructs the mean free path of those electrons. So by adding this EDS cone, we can limit the amount of space between the primary beam and the sample. And if you're familiar with SEM and EDS, you know that there's an analytical working distance that is needed in order to get the x-rays to the detector, which is usually pretty far away from the pull piece. So that's why this cone is pretty, pretty tall and it kind of flips over the other way. Yeah. Similarly, there is an accessory for low KV imaging. Uh, for low KV imaging, you're often working closer to the pull piece. And so this is in principle the same thing, but the cone is a lot shorter so you can work at closer working distances. So for ESA mode, we use a special gaseous secondary electron detector. It's a flexible printed circuit board that plugs into the same spot as the large field detector. So you replace this before you um, pump down the chamber. And the detector itself uh, sits with a little uh, pressure limiting aperture, an additional pressure limiting aperture here at the base of the pull piece. It kind of snaps on like these accessories. And so if you're going to be using pressures higher than about two tor, you do need to um, add to this detector and uh, pressure limiting aperture. And it does reduce your field of view in the imaging, but it's necessary in order to keep this experiment safe. So the GSET detector pretty much works similarly to the large field detector. Introduce your gas, interact the beam, your negative charge buildup appears, ionize the chamber gas, and the signal goes to the detector. And because of the position of the detector, um, the, the geometry, it collects pure secondary electron signals. So it's, it does create really high resolution images. It doesn't get as much noise or backscattered electrons like the large field detector. 
So um, let's talk a little bit more about what we can do in this mode with an increased pressure inside the chamber. So it gives us a little bit more flexibility uh, in terms of keeping our sample moist. You could increase the chamber pressure really high to maintain that liquid phase in, on the sample. Um, but that does start to deteriorate, deteriorate your imaging res uh, resolution. So what we can also do with the quanta is decrease the temperature of the stage. And so then when we increase the chamber pressure, we can start to condense water on the surface of the sample without increasing the pressure too much. So uh, one of the questions I'm asked most often is if you can image uh, particles suspended in water. So on the left here, you can actually see water droplets condensed on the cooling stage um, on our instrument. And you can see this is on in cross section, these water droplets here. You can't actually image through a water droplet. It's not transparent to an electron beam. So you're still going to get surface sensitive information and see the water droplet itself. You're not usually going to be able to penetrate it and see through it. So the cooling stage that Thermo Fisher has made for this microscope uh, looks like this. You replace the stage inside the quanta with this assembly right here. It's a Peltier cooling stage. So uh, the thermoelectric module sits right in the base of this assembly here. And the thermal couple sits right underneath the sample. The sample gets mounted on this little puck and this drops on top right there. And the range of the stage can be from about minus 25 degrees C to 55 degrees C. And I never really use it on the far ends of each of the ranges because they're not, it's not super stable at very low temperatures. Um, and I've only ever really used it at lower temperatures. And the, the computer interface allows you to uh, create and set up timed uh, pressure increases, temperature increases, and you can also do humidity, relative humidity cycling to look at changes in your sample throughout those, um, those cycles. So some things to consider, first of all, the sample assembly and the sample size. So these are all of the sample holders that we have currently for this stage that pop right into this top here. It just drops right in. We have this little cup that you can put a sample in. So if you're condensing water, you can completely submerge it in that cup. There's a flat sample holder here. We have in the past had the machine shop make a tilted sample holder. And recently we made this cross-sectional holder here. So you can squeeze a little sample in cross-section and, and um, then it stays cold on all sides as well. Um, which brings us to our next thing to consider, the thermal conductivity. So if you want to do an experiment where you want to precipitate water on the stage, you need to think about your sample size and its thermal conductivity. So for example, here, if you're looking at like a sponge and it's, it's tall, let's say like a centimeter tall, um, if you bring the stage temperature down and then the chamber pressure up to condense water, you may condense water on the coldest parts of the stage, but because your sample is not thermally conductive, you're not gonna see water precipitate on or condense on the surface there. Um, the other thing you need to consider is the vapor pressure of your material. We do not want to evaporate any materials inside the SEM and coat the inside of the chamber. So uh, a lot of times in the past, we've, we've frozen samples on the stage first, but it's really important that you know uh, all the properties about your material before we put it into the SEM just to keep it safe. And so we can, you can talk to managers if you're interested in a, in a project like this, and we can make sure that all the bases are covered so we don't damage the microscope. So the fun example that we like to use when we're training is just dissolving and reprecipitating salt. So um, in this video here, you can see salt grains. What we've done is we've lowered the temperature of the stage to about two degrees C. And we slowly started to increase the pressure. And as we increased the pressure, we started to condense water. The water dissolves the salt. And then all we need to do is decrease the pressure and we can recrystallize the salt. Another really cool example is on the right here. Um, so the cooling stage was used to cool a super hydrophobic uh, silane post sample. Um, and so as they cooled the stage in the presence of the water vapor inside the chamber, they were able to um, uh, uh, create frost on the surface of those posts. So that's kind of a summary of the cooling capabilities on the Quanta 650 FEG. And so next I'm going to talk a little bit about the newest capability that's coming to our microscope, the Catan Murano heating stage. So this isn't uh, completed yet, so I don't have any examples from our stage, but I'm going to just go over in principle how this works. 
So it allows rapid heating and cooling of specimens up to about 900 degrees C through resistive heating. And you can record the temperature uh, over time along with your images and uh, create a very comprehensive data set. And so this particular holder comes with special holders for both imaging and for EBSD. So you can do in situ heating and look at the crystallographic changes in your samples. And so this stage has been used for other kinds of experiments involving oxidation of materials or reactivity, chemical reactivity and synthesis, crystallization, um, decomposition of materials and corrosion. So there's a number of things that you can do with this stage. And this is the stage, how it looks. Um, it has, how it's kind of like broken down. Um, it has this small little sample mount here that's a silicon wafer that has these little graphite uh, um, pads on the side. And this is, a, this is a consumable item. So they're rated to last for about 10 hours at 950 degrees C but a lot longer if you're, if you're not planning on going to 950 degrees C. So this is a cross section of the holder. There are clamps on either side and it clamps the silicon wafer um, in the middle and on the bottom, it has this little graphite pad that comes in contact with the thermal couple. And so this is how it's reading the temperature from the stage. And so how you mount the sample is actually, uh, you use another graphite pad. This is for two reasons. One, it helps you increase the working distance a little bit but it also mirrors the, um, what the thermal couple is measuring on the bottom of the wafer, so you'll get a more accurate temperature reading. And then you mount your little sample here onto the surface of that graph uh, graphite pad with a water-soluble um, thermal paste. And so we have that paste, and you have to use that paste, you can't use um, anything else. So the sample size needs to be about 4.5 millimeters wide and 1.5 mill millimeters tall. So we have very small sample size. And this is so it takes less energy and time to heat the sample and the temperature throughout the whole sample is more consistent. So this is the actual size of the little um, sample holder next to a quarter here and that just clips right into there. Um, so heating in the SEM is, is a little bit, or can be a little bit challenging. So when you heat up the sample, you will create secondary electrons and you can use the Everhart thermally detector. So just like normal imaging, you can use that detector. But the other um, source of, of um, imaging artifacts are thermal, thermionically emitted electrons from the heating of that sample. Um, and so this can wash out your image and make it really hard to get a good, good picture. So uh, what the Gitan Moreno, Graham Moreno seeding stage comes with as a, as a heating shield. And so this is kind of multi-purpose. It of course protects the internal components of the SEM from that high temperature, but you can also, and of course you can collect your secondary electrons for imaging with the Everhart thermally detector, but it also can have an applied bias on it to attract those really low energy thermionically emitted electrons. So you can reduce the artifacts in your image. Uh, but wait, there's more. You can also use the heating stage in uh, low vacuum and ESEM mode. As far as I can tell from my research, you, it's safe to use the GSED detector for these types of experiments. So um, this is what the stage looks like. This is the imaging stage. Here's the heating shield with a little uh, hole for imaging on the top. And here is the EBSD stage. So it's pre-tilted. It has a special shield in this picture here. This is not our instrument, but this is a FIB. This is the uh, um, uh, electron gun, the ion gun, our EBSD detector and secondary electron detector here. And so the stage is pre-tilted towards the EBSD detector. And so there are a number of things to consider before doing an experiment like this. And this is probably just a small list because I haven't gotten my hands on this, this stage yet, but a few things to consider before you start heating up your sample in the SEM is that you can't melt the sample. So we cannot melt the sample. I mean, especially with this holder, you don't want it dripping all over the microscope. It can also damage the, the um, heating stage. Um, the other thing we don't want to do is create a thermal evaporator inside our SEM chamber. So we don't want to evaporate your metals on the EBSD detector or the inside of the chamber. From everybody I've spoken to so far that has a heating stage in their SEM, only one person has said that they've had any kind of problem. And the problem was that they evaporated metal on their EBSD detector. So we're going to try and avoid that. So it's really important to know um, the vapor pressure at different temperatures of your material so we can avoid that. 
And then finally, this SEM does have an auxiliary gas port, so we can do some uh, or introduce some other gases into the chamber to look at um, other kinds of reactions in situ. So a few cool examples using this particular stage here on the left, two metal oxide semiconductor film crystallization processes. So in this case, indium silicon oxide and indium tungsten oxide. So on the left here um, along the process, this is the start of crystallization. And then on the right, this is the final temperature for full crystallization. And this was actually using the backscattered electron detector. And then over on the right here, using the EBSD heating stage, they were looking at the refinement of grain structures and additive manufactured titanium alloys using EBSD. So they rapidly heated the sample to see the before and after heat treatment grain structures um, in the alpha on the top here and beta phases to understand the exact onset of recrystallization and to use this to understand how they can control the grain size of this material. So you can see this in situ. So we're very excited, especially about the potential EBSD experiments that will come from this heating stage because next month we are going to install a brand new uh, Oxford Symmetry 2 EBSD detector, which is the new state-of-the-art EBSD detector by Oxford Instruments. It's gonna replace a nearly 10-year-old EBSD detector that's currently on the Quanta. So you'll be able to collect much higher resolution EBSD maps, more patterns per second. So it will, your mapping will only take a fraction of the time that it currently does. I know you guys all love doing 12 hour EBSD maps, but no more, you won't have to do that anymore. Um, it also will come with Aztec Crystal, which is a great post-processing software. And um, I'm really excited about the SIF importer. I know if, if anybody's here that uses EBSD, you will no longer have to sit at the computer, enter all your lattice parameters into the twist software. So I'm very excited about that. Um, so since we've been talking about low vac mode during this presentation as well, this EBSD detector on this particular microscope will allow you to operate in low vacuum mode. This means that you can perform EBSD experiments on uh, insulating materials like geological materials, uh, which is what I use the microscope quite a bit for. So we're very excited about that. Um, and so with that, just to kind of summarize what we talked about, um, I hope that you now know that the quanta can actually do uh, cooling, in situ cooling, uh, using special detectors that you may have not even known existed. The G said and the LFD is always in there. Um, and a brief introduction to the Gatan Murano heating stage, which will hopefully be available sometime in the next month or two for both imaging and EBSD. And then finally, look, look, um, stay tuned for our new EBSD detector, and we're also getting new EDS detector on this microscope. So in a few months, you'll be able to do all the crazy experiments that you want on this microscope. Um, and so with that, thank you so much for coming today. Uh, my whole team is here, Elizabeth King and Nathaniel Cabot, and we're ready to discuss with you any questions that you might have about uh, heating, cooling, ESEM mode, or low vac mode at the Quanta. So thank you. Very nice. Thanks, Terza. I do see a couple questions in the, the chat. I'm not sure uh, you might have addressed them along the way. It looks like Kamran Fargani uh, is asking about the cooling mechanism. I think you might have covered that in one of your slides. But yeah, Kamran, so it's a thermal still? electric device. I'm not well versed in thermal electric devices, but um, that's, that's a Peltier cooling stage. Kunma has a good question. You see in the chat, he's asking. So I see, will the heating stage, stage compromise the signal to noise of the image? That is a really good question and something that I've been wondering. I do know that um, Thermo Fisher actually does uh, make a high temperature uh, detector that also gets stuck onto the base of the pole piece. So it's like right on the optic axis, um, which probably will be better for that type of imaging. So that's something that we may look into in the future. Like I said, I haven't actually seen this stage in action. They did test it a little bit. And I know that they were able to image, but that was the very first thing that I thought when I saw that heating shield with the little hole in the top. I was like, how is that going to work? But, um, but yeah, so that's a great question. So thank you. So uh, somebody asked about using the cooling stage on the FIB. Uh, the cooling stage actually has a whole assembly electronics interface, uh, cooling water, which I think is just to remove the heat from the Peltier device. But um, currently we can't use it on the Helios. Um, it, maybe we could if we modified the Helios. I, I don't know. I don't know that you want to, because I think that 
I think you could get a cooling stage, but I think that the way it's set up with the Quanta is very specific to the USAM operations. So it might require a different stage. And I think that's more like in the cryophobe realm. So probably you'd want lower temperatures than, than what the stage can do or, or stably do. So the resolution available in high temperatures. So uh, resolution, you mean um, the spatial resolution? Um, heating the sample. So, I mean, it, it, the more you heat, the harder it's going to be to achieve a, a high resolution image. Um, I have, there are a number of really great like review papers that show you the artifacts of heating. And there's a lot of adjustments that you need to make to the detector so that you're like um, uh, um, adjusting like the gain or the bias and just making sure that you're collecting enough signal. Like I said, like I haven't jumped on there yet. So I'm, I'm, I'm interested to see what it will look like and if we're going to need an additional detector. Um, so again, good question. Um, I have another question. Can you introduce CO2 and measure CO2 concentration? Sorry, I'm having a hard time flipping through the questions because uh, in the quanta chamber or locally, locally near the sample. So I actually included a slide in here. This is directly from the quanta manual. So these are the other auxiliary gases that you can introduce into the chamber. Um, there are some modifications that we need to make. So we can't just like, you know, hook up a, a tank to the quanta and, and let it rip. So the, the aperture sizes on the pressure limiting apertures are different. Right now, the one that's installed at the base of the quanta pull piece is 500 microns. So uh, you can, uh, depending on the size of that pressure limiting aperture, you have limitations on what the pressures you can actually use are. Um, but if you're interested in a, an experiment like this, probably what we'll have to do is consult with Thermo Fisher and just make sure that, you know, we're, we're doing it. everything correctly. We don't want to introduce, like, you know, the, it depends, again, on the, the gas, uh, the tank pressure, what we have to, you know, reduce it to. So if, if anybody here is interested in that, shoot me an email afterwards and uh, we can get the ball rolling on that. I think part of the reason that question is people want to do catalysis in situ. When you are right. heat, it's an add gas, they want to see. But getting the product out, that's a different problem. But that yeah. is uh, fundamentally, there's no reason why we can't do that. So Very is the heating question. stage compatible with backscattered electron imaging? So there was actually a lot of, um, I, I read a lot of different things about this. So because the backscattered electron detector is like a semiconductor device, if it gets too hot, it can reduce the semiconductor properties of the, of the detector, I guess. And so um, I read that you can't typically, but I think that that's in older style stages because, um, uh, so this uh, work right here used the backscattered electron detector in a quanta. So it looks like you can, you can use it uh, the backscattered electron detector. I think that the, the heating can also emit light. And so that can uh, affect the backscatter detector as well or over overwhelm the detector. So I think that with the heating shield that also helps protect that from, from that. And so like the angle of the backscattered electrons, the, the high angle will give you more compositional contrast anyway. So as long as they're along the primary beam axis, you'll still get some good compositional information. Any other questions? Okay, well, thank you, everyone. Look yeah, thank you, everyone. Um, and then also there's a few more people here. A lot of the things that I introduced today um, were inspired by all of you guys that have needs and uh, for your for your really awesome research in our lab. So if there's any ever anything that you'd like to see in the SEM facility, please reach out to me. I'm always excited to talk about new capabilities and new things that we can do in our lab. So um, all of this was inspired by you guys. So just you know, let me know if there's something you want, and we we can see what we can do. We will. <laughs> I'm not making any promises, Chad. I'm just saying we can work together to figure out how to make it, how to get. <laughs> Sounds good. <Sing> from Baya. <laughs> well, thanks everyone. Um, yeah, very really nice. Look forward to uh, lots of good research once uh, we've got the heating stage and I think the cooling stage is ready to go now. So mm -hmm. CM team is on standby. We're ready.
Thanks, everyone.